Thank you, thank you. Welcome everyone to this first session of data and business model. We wanted to make sure that our message is crystal clear today with you. Standards do not break the bank. Whenever you produce data, we make sure that we build interoperability for you. So if you comply with any of the standards over here, or maybe all of them, we will actually help you save money. Let's start as with the why we decided this session to come up first uh, this morning is, as you know, uh, mobility data is all about building interoperability in different transportation system with the use of data format, shared data infrastructure and standardized data practice. A lot of people often ask us if we're only stewarding one or the other, if there is any war happening between any of us here. And I just want to make sure that people know we're friends. We actually love spending time together via Zoom a lot, unfortunately, but also whenever we can meet in conferences, I think what we do is to make sure that we keep on having this very good conversation with each other and this very great relationship. So I will introduce you a little bit of our speakers, then we will present our version of the story and we will ask you your input, your comment, your version of the story. The first speaker will be Christophe Duquesne. He is a mobility expert for a very long time. He was actually one of the pioneers of traveler information. Uh, he is also the proud leader of the NetEx working group at CEN. So you will hear with him all about the trends model NetEx and Siri world that a lot of people who have been working with European stakeholders have heard. And he is for that supporting by the data for pt project uh, led by IT4PT and UITP. He is based in France. And as you can see, you can reach out to him in French and English. Our second speaker is Andrew. He is the very recently appointed executive director at Open Mobility Foundation. I think he deserves a round of applause for that big role he has just taken. <laughs> he is based in Seattle, Washington, and he has a master in public policy and administration uh, from the University of Southern California. You can reach out to him in English and maybe other languages that I wasn't aware of. <laughs> nope, just English. Um, and he is a former, he has worked a lot among cities, so he will also be able to share with you that uh, particular perspective. Then we have Bourne, uh, who has joined us from the Netherlands as one of the public advisors for MAS, for the Dutch Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. He is also the one who coordinates the amazing open working group that leads TOMP API. Uh, most of the time, he's the one making sure that we all talk to each other. So thank you, Bourne, for that. Uh, you can reach out to him in Dutch and English. Thomas, uh, he is the customer success manager for En Route. He is also based in France and he had a very long curriculum. So we only had to pick a couple of his uh, degrees. You can reach out to him in French, English and Japanese. And what they do is actually they make interoperability seamless because they actually have a conversion, same as you could use a I don't know, any translator you have on your phone. So he will tell you all about that. And last but not least, we have Gislain as the project director of uh, mass standardization from FabMob. They are the one who released very recently a report on the different governance and standards that exist in our industry and also working on the standardization of account-based mobility, actually. So he will tell you all about that. He's also based in France. And I believe you can reach out to him in French, English, and German. So with all of this, um, I will start by giving you a little bit of the standards that we steward at Mobility Data. So first of all, what is GTFS? One of uh, the first standard we steward. It stands for General Transit Feed Specification. It has been designed for traveler information only and it's traveler centric. We know it has been used for a little bit of operational, a little bit of other things, but what we want to remind you is we are traveler centric. Uh, it was designed uh, as 
a trip planning specification first initiated by TriMet and Google. And we actually have in the room somewhere you will meet Bibiana, who is one of the very first author of GTFS, and we are so proud to have her with us today. Since then, the baby grew to become one of the de facto standards of the entire industry, and it what supported us mobility data becoming who we are today as one of the its steward. What does it represent now, GTFS? It has six core areas. It will detail the different stops of your transit network, the routes, the agency details, obviously the calendar, so the schedule, the trips, and the stop times. So basically all you need to know to catch your nearest train, bus, ferry, if you want. GTFS, since uh, it was first written, was extended to represent a lot of other things that mean a lot to travelers, shapes, Continue stops where you can flag uh, a bus whenever it goes through the street. Different transfers, pathways that is mostly used for people with different mobility needs. Vehicle, if you can take your bike or not uh, in the metro, in the train. The different station entrance, the routing in the station, boarding areas, translation and text to speech. On top of GTFS schedule being the static data and the representation of the description of your network uh, was added GTFS real time for four main use cases, the trip updates, localization of vehicle, service change and service alert. So this represents our part of the work in public transit. For the second part of the work, which is GBFS and shared mobility, it was actually built with the same idea. So Mitch, who is the author of GBFS, actually got inspired by Bibiana, Google and everyone's work on GTFS to create one for shared mobility. And what does it represent as the shared mobility information? Again, traveler centric. It represents the description of the system, so that would be the equivalent of your agency in GTFS, the different stations, so obviously that would be equivalent to your stops, the different vehicle, uh, if it's a scooter, a moped, a bike, I think we heard ski at some point. Um, uh, and we also have the travel rules, uh, so where you can actually go, where you can actually park. You also have pricing and alerts. So system alerts very much as in GTFS real time because GBFS will give you what vehicle is available in real time. You will know if a vehicle is down, if the system is down, if it's not functioning and so on. But what we really wanted to focus today is what is interoperability? How do we build it for you? So it's three different layers. The first one is the specification. So that's what I've just explained to you. It's making sure that all of you here can share with us input when we build the specification. Then it's also supporting you uh, with data quality, the different stakeholders to make sure that whatever data is produced is meaningful to the traveler. and the most important part for our conversation today is the ecosystem. That's why we have these lovely people with me on stage today to make sure that the ecosystem and the different stakeholders working together are actually creating and using and improving data as an entire industry. So now how do we build interoperability? Well, first, I think it will be mm, giving honor and an homage to the expertise that we have all around the room because it takes a lot of effort to create mapping different uh, between different standards. I know that some of us have tried in the room. I see at least uh, Maria from the Mass Alliance Working Group. We did a lot of work on that. And what we also realize is the base of that is to share knowledge and experience between all of us. So many times have I reached out to some of you and say, hey, how did you solve that problem? because we need help. And we can only do that if it's based on trust. The trust we have between us, all of here, our different organization, because, but also the trust that you give us when you ask us to work with different partners. And last but not least, transparency. We wanna make sure that the work we do behind closed doors, behind the scenes, in working all together, in aligning our specification is transparent to you. Hence, you coming here today and that's part 
of the ecosystem. You're part of it. So we're trying to connect you together. Thank you for joining us to the event today and also to share best practice and building bridges. Very recently, for example, we had a question from uh, Queensland Department of Transport in Australia asking how they should converge different operators. And what we did was, well, in France, they did the same for the Paris region and we turned to the data for PT team saying that you solve the problem with them, maybe you can help Australia instead of trying to keep everything behind uh, our own uh, path, let's say. So enough about me, enough about uh, GTFS and GBFS, let's hear all about what's happening in the world of Transmodel. Thank you very much, Tito, and uh, so thank you very much for setting up this event and for inviting me. <laughs> I'm very happy to be here wi with you to, to, to have the opportunity to exchange and talk about what we're doing and how we try to, to work wi with, with mobility data. Um, so my, my, my talk here is going to be mainly uh, about uh, the uh, European ecosystem, so based on uh, the, 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 the transmodal, uh, what we call the transmodal ecosystem. The way we have worked in Europe is very different from the way GTFS has been built. GTFS is really based on a use case from existing data to go to the journey planner for so a specific use case, where in Europe we started with a, a generic public transport data model whose name is Transmodel. So this is a conceptual data model, meaning that, that we define words, we define their definitions, we define the relations with, between, with, between each of these concepts and main attributes of them. Th there is no data exchange here, just all the concepts we can use in public tra transport. But that's really everything. We, there we will have not only passenger information, we will have control actions, we will have drivers, we, we will have all, 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 all the things you need for uh, scheduling, for AVMS. So that's a very large model covering all the needs we can face in public transport and any kind of mobility. When we say public transport now, it's any transport which is advertised, meaning that any micro mobility is also covered by public transport when we say pu public transport. And from this data model, we derived exchange protocols. One is Detex, that Netex, Netex is a project I'm, I'm leading in, in, in Europe, uh, which is focusing on exchange of data of scheduled information, so everything which is scheduled, which is planned in advance. Then we have Siri, which is for real time. The meaning of real time is I anything happening in one single operating day, where so NetX will cover things with calendars for with a long-term long view. Siri is, is really only for one single day. And Opera, which is currently under definition, is giving you what ha what has happened on the network. So how did the service perform? How were the, the, the network used? How many people you had? Uh, where they were starting for their journey from and where they, where they were going to? And so GTFS and GTFS RT here are kind of a subpart, subset of, of, of what you can have in NetX and, 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 and Siri, but with a very accurate focus on passenger information and providing information to journey planner where it's uh, still in NetX. We have all this information about operating and, and information of the from the systems which are inside the global public transport ecosystem. This is also a, v a view I can, oh, there's one, one part is missing, I don't know why, <laughs> which is the important one. Um, uh, so here it's a view of Transmodel with a set of, so do you still can see NetX and Siri, Opera, OGP is uh, the interface for journey planners. On, on the right you have a set of older national exchange protocols which were still based on Transmodel, but Transmodel started in the 90s and, and uh, so, so, so trans exchange is from UK, Neptune, Trident Tri Tri from France, Noptis uh, uh, in from Nordic countries. At this, this point now, we have one focus on NetX and Siri because well, the part which is missing on my slide here is showing that there's a regulation, so a law in Europe making NetX and Siri mandatory and, and this law is defining the fact that every uh, uh, country in Europe must have a national access point where they disseminate this uh, information, where they make, make it available uh, using NetX and Siri. And the, the basic of it is to say uh, operators or uh, uh, authority are not obliged to create data, but whenever they have any data, it's mandatory to provide them international access point using NetX and, and Siri. So this is a European law, and then th this applies in, in every single uh, country in Europe. 
uh, and this is covering all the transmodal scope. I'm going, not going to go into the details of everything here in, in, in what is it's a picture of what you have in transmodal with several parts. So you have part one, part two, part three, uh, which are the heart was really, it is a network, the, 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 the timing information, the vehicle description and the scheduling. This is more or less cover, co what is used by, by, by NetExt. Uh, you have the part four, which is operating monitoring and control. So that's all, everything about AVMS and about the real-time information, which is going to be disseminated in, in series. And it's also a part when, when, where you can find the description of control actions. Uh, the part five if, is fair management. Uh, so that's, that's not ticketing, that's really describing, describing the fair offer, de describing the fact that uh, there is an offer, a, a, a product, a fair product, which is available, and all the rights that it, it, gives, it gives you. The part six is passenger information. Part seven is, is, is uh, uh, driver management. Uh, we have the part eight, which is um, uh, all the stat statistic information and statistics. And the very new part 10, which is about what we call alternative modes. So that's bike sharing, uh, carpooling, car sharing, and all the new modes which recently appeared. Uh, about these modes, so the coverage of, of Transmodal and, and NetX and Siri is very wide. It's every classical, uh, what you call conventional mode of transport, like, like bus. Uh, so the scheduled mode of operation, but it also already includes the flexible operations, so a bit the same scope of GTFS Flex. And these alternative modes are, are really covering vehicle pulling, vehicle sharing, and vehicle rental. So we say vehicle, so it's, it's any kind of vehicle. So when we say vehicle sharing, it can be bike sharing or uh, car sharing or any kind of new incoming vehicle that could be shared. One way of seeing this, I, I think this slide may be important. I could stay quite long on, on it, but it gives you an overview of a generic system where Siri, NetX, GTFS, RT, and, and, and GTFS, and GTFS are, are, are used. Um, at the center, the orange part is kind of an aggregator. So it's collecting first information from several systems uh, uh, being scheduling systems. So you obviously can have several scheduling systems when you have several operators, uh, uh, which is very, 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 very often. You will need to collect the information from all these uh, scheduling systems. Typically, it could be the, the, the you probably know the Hastis Giro uh, Canadian uh, brand who is, who is pr providing this, this kind of information. That's one of the provider, and, and you can collect this information using NetX. That's, for example, what's happening in the Netherlands, where every Hastis system is providing data uh, using NetX. It has also here uh, this scheduling system and in input. You may have some reference data, for example, a stop reference a regional or national database, and you want any scheduling system to use this reference data. This is uh, happening all, all over in, 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 in Europe, in, in the Netherlands, in, in uh, Switzerland, uh, not yet in France, for <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, but, but so you provide this reference stuff, and systems are, it's mandatory for any providing system to use them. Uh, so the aggregator is going to aggregate this information, meaning that it it will harmonize it and make the fact that if you have two bus operators operating the same stop, then it makes it co co consistent and current for, 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 for the, uh, the, the passenger at the end. Then on the bottom side, you have the Siri, the, the, the AVMS, which can be uh, usually it's an AVMS, so the, the, the real-time data system providing provider who is going also to use reference data but collect and provide the information using Siri. Um, one important thing here is on the top you see that you can collect a lot of other information. When you get s information from an AVMS or from uh, a scheduling system, you may not have the details about fair information, but you may not have in the, the details about accessibility and, 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 or about occupancy. So that's very often a lot of different systems which are going to provide you with the additional data, uh, you need to gather and aggregate them together before uh, providing them to the, to, the, to the end user. And from this aggregate sets of set of data, you will go to open data and provide the information. So th at that point, that's really the point where before you, you were really in the transmodal world, mainly based on NetX and Siri, but when, when you go to the open data and disseminate the information, to the journal planner or directly to the, to, to the user, 
Netflix and Siri are obviously good good solutions, but obviously GTFS and GTFS are RT or kind of mandatory, a lot of systems of uh, apps are using it, and that's why you see here uh, th this, meaning that we do need to work together uh, with mobility data to make everything consistent. Of, of course, if there was no link between the, the transmodal world and GTFS and GTFS RT, that would be a mess to be able to provide everything in NetX and GTFS uh, uh, ecosystem. So that's really a very important work, work for, for us and something we are focusing more and more uh, on, on the, on the now on the on, on in coming days. Uh, another thing you may not know that m may be of interest for you is the process we are using to define the standards in, in Europe. Um, so Europe is a set of countries. Uh, in each country, there is a national body. It's AFNAR in France. It's DIN in, 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 in UK. And so every, every country has, as uh, I, I see in UK, even there's Brexit, but we're still working with them for standardization. But so every, every, every country has a, a national uh, standardization body where there are some working groups. I'm leading the French working group for uh, uh, that exchange for public transport. And each of these working group are sending experts at the European uh, not standardization uh, level. So all these experts are coming with the requests the, from, from their own country. And with all these experts and all these requests, we build a, a standard based on consensus. So it's, it's not a, a voting process. We need to agree and have a consensus on everything. Sometimes it takes time, but it works well, quite well. So that also means that we have sometimes some, some feature which are specific to some countries because, for example, in Norway, they do need to cross the fjords uh, and we, with some specific boats, on demand boats, and, and that's something obviously you're not going to have in France. So we need to collect all this information, put them together, and this creates the, 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 the standards. And once we have a standard, there, there is what we call a European ballot, uh, uh, meaning that this is going to be sent all over Europe. Every standardization body will have, uh, will, will say if they are okay or not, but it's not only the standardization body. Any European citizen can get this information and vote for or against the standard. And at the end, we have a standard which is going to be usually approved. And if it's not approved, we have to rework up to when everybody is okay, okay, okay with it. One thing I didn't say, say, to start to work on the standards, we need to have five uh, European country agreed to work together to, de to, to define it. Uh, and then this is going to, the standard is going to be disseminated by, by the CEN and the national bodies, but there will be also organisms like, like Data for PT, so I'm representing Data for PT, helping the, for the implementation of the standard. So doing, providing tools, providing training, providing support, and, and, and so on. So that's, these are the two, two tracks. So that's basically the process we have uh, in, in, in Europe. And, and ju just to, to terminate this uh, uh, presentation, uh, so it's, as I said before, it's very important for us to work closely between mobility data and, 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 uh, and that data for PT for, for, for this European standards, where you do have this GXFS or any GBFS, GTFS. I don't know if you use the term GXFS. I used it in my presentation, but, but I use it also in the presentation. So GFS. <laughs> or GFS. Uh, so it, you can see it as, as a, a, a use case focus for uh, journey planning uh, uh, version of, of, of NetX with the light. We we will t I will talk it about it to, to tomorrow. But when you use NetX, you never use everything at once. We do what we call profile, and you could see kind of uh, GTF as being a profile, so a subset of, of NetX, and we, we we do need to to to, to make this. Uh, con consistent. One thing which is also very important for us, and that's, I guess that's true for mobility data and, 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 and uh, for, for the European domain, is it's very important for all users, so for all of you, to, to check what, what is ex ex existing. It's very often people try to kind of reinvent the wheel, but there's a lot of work that has been done, so it's, 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 it's very important to have discussion with, with, with us. Whenever you, f you feel that something is not existing, 
come, come, come to us and we will check if that exists somewhere. That uh, I may say, you go, go to mobility data for this because, because that's the best answer for you. Or Tuto may say, go, 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 go to the CN domain. But there's already a huge coverage of, 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 of niche, which is it's, it's not everything, but that's, that's already, uh, already huge. So that's also, we need you to, 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 to communicate about this, and we need you to come for, for to, to, to us. We, we, we can't. Uh, uh, we can't know. There's no way for us to know that, that you have a specific need. So it's, uh, that, that's this exchange is, is very, very uh, important. And as I said before, we're working together with mobility data, and and it's just two sides of the same goal, those of the same metal, but but we have the same goal, working on interoperability, and it's coming from two point of views. But at the end of the day, that's exactly the same kind of information and the same goal we are trying to, to, to achieve. W one thing which is important, we are trying from now to have mappings. So whenever we do something new, we are going to have a mapping between what is existing in the, the GBAG XFS world and what is ex existing in the Transmodal ecosystem. The first one was done with the NetX part five on, on uh, alternative modes, which can be mapped to GBFS. So we have a shared official mapping between GBFS and NetX part five, and it, it has been published by, GB, by, by mobility data and data for PT. And that's something we're going to do for every New new works of we should work start very soon to work for example on on the on Siri so we have a European profile named Epiperte so ba based on Siri, which is going to be mapped to to GTFS RRT and that's going to be still official between us uh, and, and mobility data and that's really something we want to do to to to, to do and that also uh, enforce us when we do something to first look what is existing exactly in GTF, GTFS RRT. I'm, I'm a CN transmodal expert, not yet the GTFS 81, so I need to go dive in it, ask mobility data if, if they don't already have an answer, and make sure that what we, what we are defining is consistent with, 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 uh, with what they have, and same thing and the, 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 the way around. So that's really what's something important we're going to work on in the coming years. I guess it's going to be some years <laughs> to have everything aligned, <laughs> but yeah. Okay, so I think that, that that's all my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christophe. And yes, so for the one who didn't know, as Christophe said, we released that mapping between GTFS and NetX Part 5 for all alternative modes. It took us almost 12 months. So please uh, be gentle, be kind with us for the next one for Siri. We also need, as Christophe said, it's also a good learning curve. Like our team have learned a lot about Siri, and I think the Christoph's team is also uh, learning about GTFS RT. So now, uh, without further ado, Andrew, please gi give us what OMF is doing. I know you've been having a lot of exciting projects. All right. Well, while we're getting the uh, the presentation sync, so I actually know what I'm saying. That's properly displayed behind me here. Um, again, my name is Andrew Glass Hastings, and uh, I just recently became the executive director of the Open Mobility Foundation. This is now week two officially. So uh, I approached this uh, this work uh, from, uh, most of my background is actually from the, the city side. Uh, I spent a lot of my career in the public sector um, and working for the city of Seattle in particular, and most recently as the mobil transit mobility director for the for the city of Seattle. And this goes back a few years. There's been a few things in between there and now. But uh, but my role with the city was at a time when uh, we were very much uh, overseeing um, aspects of the mobility system, both starting up the new mobility program at the time, as well as overseeing parking and curb space management before there were these uh, these great data standards uh, for cities to use to both manage uh, and regulate the the mobility uh, systems in the in the city and in the the public right of way. So back in in gosh the end of 2017 seems like seems like a lifetime ago at this point. Uh, we launched at the time the largest uh, dockless bike share system in the at least in the United States. And we did that without uh, without a, a common language for us to use between the three at the time uh, dockless bike share operators that uh, we uh, permitted to operate in the city. And um, and that was Spin, Lime, and Ofo back at the time. I, I remember it because it was it was the citrus colors, green, orange, and uh, and yellow bikes all around the city. But we had we had about ten thousand bikes around the city, 
uh, at the time, and uh, we're having to kind of uh, create the wheel back back then, uh, so to speak, because there was a, not an easy way for the operators um, to uh, create that common, common data standards for us as the city to be able to ingest so that we could understand uh, how their fleets were being used, how many vehicles they had um, on the streets, and make sure that they were following our regulations. And uh, so we had to kind of create our own dashboard that was gonna pull in data. And the quality of the data was a huge uh, uh, challenge because there were not um, just even common definitions about what is a, uh, what is a vehicle. And so it, uh, at the time, made it very challenging. On the, on the curb side of things, you know, we were doing a lot of, uh, and actually the city and still does, a lot of uh, the understanding of how our curbs are being used. Uh, the demand for particularly the, the curb from a paid parking perspective, we were doing hand counts. We were hiring consultants who then were using interns to go out and actually count the number of cars on any particular block that would then translate into you know, our definitions of demand for that space and we'd set parking rates based on it. Believe it or not, that's a very kind of progressive way of actually setting price, uh, um, parking pricing in American cities, uh, actually to do it on, on demand. Uh, demand based. So my, my presentation today is uh, is really speaking a little bit about um, two data standards in particular that uh, that are under OMF's purview, and it's the mobility data specification and the and the curb data specification. And unlike GTFS and GBFS, these uh, standards are really they're, they're internal. They are meant as management and regulatory tools for for government. They're not consumer facing, and that's a big distinction. There are some points of of overlap and intersection, and so interoperability is important, but they they serve different purposes. And so the, the context here a little bit, I mean, as we know, for for you know longest time, all of our physical inf infrastructure was really manifested through um, uh, through like these physical assets. Signs, um, in particular, signs continue to play a really key role. Also, uh, actual physical parking meters, um, you know, people actually out there directing traffic. And so now, uh, even the past you know, 10 so years and going forward, a lot of that has begun to be digitized, at least in at least in its representation. In particular, when it comes to when it comes to mapping, and and then also from the city regulatory perspective, we're now able to uh, actually manage the mobility systems by being able to kind of create zones where, for example, scooters and bikes uh, are allowed or not allowed, or need to go slower, et cetera. So then we're thinking about a little more about uh, what's, what's coming and how data standards will play into things like uh, sidewalk and delivery um, vehicles or um, uh, robots or drones um, or even autonomous vehicles and autonomous vehicles from a passenger perspective, but also, of course, a, a parcel delivery perspective as well. So the Open Mobility Foundation is really focused on uh, digital infrastructure uh, to manage public space for the public good. And so our primary focus is trying to uh, allow cities to digitize their, their infrastructure, take what has traditionally been, um, has been uh, asphalt and concrete and signage and turn that into a digital representation. And we're doing that through data standards and open source software. It's a public-private uh, collaboration and that is made up uh, between cities and private companies, uh, an organization that's led by cities, supported by private companies, um, pretty unique public-private partnership in that, in that way, and uh, the cross-sector relationships uh, working towards uh, shared goals, I mean, clearly focused on how do we create uh, more sustainable, equitable, and really safe uh, cities and, and communities. Uh, our members, as I mentioned, cross-sector of, of major American cities, also internationally focused, uh, as well as um, uh, private companies and, and the philanthropic community as well. Our approach is really focused on uh, co-creation of these data standards. So we're the stewards, we're not the, the owner or we're not the, the builder ourselves, but we're fostering technology built through this public and private sector collaboration. Uh, working groups, uh, using working groups that, that, are, that are open to a very um, broad-based uh, holistic community through GitHub repositories it's, that's open to all. Um, and also focused on collaboration with, with other open projects in a, in a big way. That's, this is not happening um, just in, in isolation, in a bubble. So speaking about the, the mobility data specification, and, and this is, uh, it's an API 
focused on connecting mobility companies and, and local governments. And again, as I mentioned, it's it's an, really meant to be at this point more of an internal facing tool for cities to be able to use to both plan, manage, and regulate the mobility happening in the, in the public right of way. It's used by over 130 cities globally um, in 14 countries. A marketplace of tools for cities built on on MDS. It's focused now on um, you know e-scooters, uh, mopeds, car share, uh, bikes, but then is now turning our attention more towards uh, taxis, passenger services, TNCs, delivery bots, uh, autonomous vehicles, etc. This this uh, standard. Uh, actually was uh, not thought up as a way to help cities manage dockless um, bikes and scooter uh, fleets. Um, it was really thinking more towards how do cities uh, help, or how do they manage uh, autonomous vehicle fleets. Um, but, uh, but scooters, as we know, sort of a little bit came out of nowhere, uh, fell onto the scene, and MDS pivoted and ended up being a really important tool and had some pretty uh, quick adoption. Um, at the time, just as MDS was coming out of the city of Los Angeles, I was working for the software company Remix. And uh, you know, coming from my background of the, with Seattle, was able to work with cities around the country and even globally, uh, helping to talk about the benefits of, of adopting MDS and, and the kind of the rationale of, of creating that common language across, at the time, many multiple operators that were, uh, that were operating in the cities. So MDS is kind of at the middle of cities and companies. It's really the digital infrastructure that lets cities and companies share the information and manage devices together. Uh, it's uh, focused on, in a big way, on privacy. And I think the most important thing, takeaway from this graphic, is all of the information that's flowing to the company and all oh, just a little bit of information that flows to the city and ultimately um, to, the, to the public from there. So MDS is, is um, in, in, in it's intentional or by design to not have information about the, the actual user, about the rider. That doesn't go beyond the, the company. It's really focused on the kind of a subset of vehicle and trip data that's securely transferred to uh, the, the city and then kind of that, that public, uh, public realm, if you, would, if you will. A uh, quick note that, uh, and, and you could do a whole session on this in particular, but, but MDS is GDPR compliant. Uh, there was uh, a lot of um, in sort of dis kind of intentionality that went into making sure the, um, from a privacy perspective that MDS is a standard that could be adopted not only across the United States, but also uh, Europe as well. So the second uh, specification that we're stewarding is the curb data specification. This one is newer, just a uh, first version, just released recently, and it's really focused on helping cities manage the curb. Uh, curb space in cities across the globe is some of the most valuable real estate uh, in the entire in the entire city, and it's valuable because of all the demands that are placed upon that uh, upon that real estate upon the curb. And so we're really focused on trying to bring technology and help digitize the experience to be able to for, allow cities and the companies that need access to that curb as well as the public to get more out of it. So it's a digital tool. Um, it's this CDS curb data specification that helps cities and companies pilot and then scale dynamic curb zones. So CDS provides a mechanism for expressing what is otherwise kind of that static, that, you know, that, that one sign or sometimes that whole waterfall of signs that you see at the, at the curb trying to explain all the different regulations, all the different times of day, all the different days of the week. So the overview at its core, CDS is a set of APIs um, similar to, to MDS and, and other data standards, but this allows cities to digitally represent their curb space and then communicate that to the users, uh, whether that's the, um, the uh, um, you know, a, a delivery user, a uh, Lyft and Uber um, uh, driver, or ultimately the public. Uh, I love this graphic because it's, it's trying to very simply uh, explain sort of a complex interaction, but it's essentially taking that, uh, that parking activity, uh, and in this case, you can kind of see the, this being captured through uh, video analytics and then communicating that to the, to the city, if you will, and then the city being able to um, be able to sort of digitally represent the rules about is that curb activity, that parking, that drop off um, allowed in that space at the time, and then um, moving towards a place with when we're, uh, cities are ultimately able to uh, 
actively manage and enforce. So if there is a, a Uber drop-off that's happening in a spot that is currently reserved for, um, for either general parking or for um, Amazon or FedEx or UPS deliveries, then there can be a, a, a citation accordingly. CDS benefits cities because it gives the local governments the tools to drive data-informed change. You know, I mentioned that whole hiring uh, a consultant who then looks to interns to go out and count the, the occupancy of the curb. Um, this creates a um, an much easier, more automated way of, of, of um, uh, generating that uh, demand um, data. Allow cities to map curb regulations. So, I mean, many cities don't really understand the how their curbs are regulated today, or what the what the rules are in any given spot. They haven't mapped that. Um, supports public spaces that better reflect community priorities, driving some of those uh, the community goals of safety, sustainability, and and even uh, local business development. How do you make sure you're having the the ability to um, have customer turnover in a space, or even more importantly, perhaps as we know, the commercial activity through uh, deliveries and then it unlocks the ecosystem of tools that are being built to help cities manage this digital uh, curb and communicate with the users it also benefits companies you know in a major way just think about the the amount of inefficiency built into the the delivery systems that we rely on through UPS FedEx Amazon etc that at least 30% of their time is spent um, uh, having to find or having to make that uh, um, uh, delivery because they couldn't find the curb spot. They couldn't find the space, the legal space, uh, to make the delivery. Or as we know now, there's the the um, crowdsourced uh, what, what enforcement that's happening on the streets of New York City, where you can take pictures of double parked uh, delivery vehicles and and collect a, kind of a bounty, if you will, for it. Um, so there's a huge a huge benefit to companies in the efficiency on the curb. And then um, CDS in practice. So now there, it is actually being used, being put into practice through a, a variety of, of pilots right now. But some of the key uses, digitally sharing the regulations, mentioned that before, including the loading zone rules um, and where those loading zones are. That information can be pushed more easily to the delivery, uh, delivery drivers so they can uh, cut down on that uh, inefficiency. Um, determining real-time curb status. Uh, tracking and analyzing curb usage, actually understanding truly demand who is using the curb. Um, so when you, when cities set up a, a a loading zone, is it actually being used by for commercial loading, or is it being used primarily as as passenger loading? How do you adjust that to uh, um, to make it uh, more effective? Optimizing curb usage and access to to meet those policy goals that I mentioned. So really quickly, a little bit about what's next. So uh, current version of MDS was really focused on um, scooters and bikes and is you know some vehicle information around uh, car share in particular uh, but not a whole lot of, of uh, ability to communicate uh, for cities to communicate back to the providers the policy uh, policy rules around where scooters and bikes you know, can and can be cannot be ridden or some of the um, speed regulations things like that. And so the next version of MDS 2.0, which is under development uh, right now, just getting started, so there's ample opportunity to influence the direction of, uh, of this uh, standard update, but it's going to have a much broader uh, focus on many uh, more modes. So I mentioned the, the delivery um, robots, passenger services, uh, but in particular, now it's really setting the stage because autonomous vehicles na are now operating in um, in uh, um, cities on city streets. Want to make sure that uh, that MDS adequately uh, reflects the the needs of um, of autonomous vehicles, especially from the the city perspective, from kind of a planning, management, regulatory perspective, but also the operators, those the operators of those autonomous fleets, because the the uh, pick up and drop off the safe reliable, predictable pickup and drop off of, of, um, of those uh, trips for the, the passengers is gonna, be in, uh, is gonna be really important. And this is an area that I'm really curious to see as we evolve, 
there is certainly now we start to cross over the the internal focus of MDS. Perhaps there becomes a, a consumer facing role as, or perhaps there's room for collaboration with an, another existing standard, not wanting to recreate the wheel that uh, so that you as an autonomous vehicle hailer know where to go and know when to go and where that uh, that vehicle is going to, to pick you up. And then there's also a big focus on the policy API improvements. Uh, this is a this is an open source community, so we welcome uh, involvement and both in terms of the further development of, of MDS and CDS. Uh, both those standards have ongoing working groups. Uh, there is a robust uh, both committee structure, working group structure to be able to get involved, um, and uh, you can get more information. Of course, you can't click on these links right now, but um, but uh, you can get more information right here at the, the website to find out um, how to get involved. So thank you so much. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> I'm still always amazed by the delivery robots. I, like, oh, okay. that's, a, that's, that's a feature I really want to see and how we can actually bridge it for the users, as you said. Now we will have uh, a presentation of another API that is bridging two different stakeholders. So Bourne will present to us Tomp API. Yeah, thanks, uh, Tito. Very happy to be on stage. Uh, my name is indeed Bon Bakermans, and I'm a simple policy advisor uh, at the ministry in the Netherlands, Ministry of Transport or Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. Doesn't matter uh, that much. Um, I'm going to tell you why I am as a simple policy advisor am on, uh, on this stage. Um, and secondly, also um, a bit about the TOMP API. I think the fourth initiative that is presented, um, but also very happy to be on stage with the other members of the mobility community so we can show you indeed that interoperability is what uh, what we want. Um, so I'm also here as a representative of the of the TOMP working group, but let's go to the uh, to the next slide. Yeah, so about five or six years ago, we started at a ministry with a mobility as a service program. Um, and this started with a lot of conversations with the market parties um, to define what is actually mobility as a service. And of course, um, you know it as it is uh, the next revolution in mobility, but back then it was like also a container term. Everybody thought maybe shared mobility is mobility as a service, but what is it actually? Um, and that's when we defined those seven functions for mobility as a service. Um, also with the perspective of the government on how it can optimize the total mobility system and also enhance sustainability and, for example, inclusivity. So first of all, the, the first function is personal aspects and preferences. For us, it's very important that you can enter in a, a platform by saying, for example, I don't like to travel or I don't like to use a bike within rainy conditions but also I'm in a wheelchair or I'd like to, I have my own car so I can use my, uh, my own car. Then there are a few other functions, first of all. Of secondly, um, you need to be able to plan your trip. Um, this is a multimodal trip, so you can use your own car, but also a shared car, public transport, you name it. Um, then I want to be able to book my trip within the same platform. I'd like to travel and also get support during my trip, for example, when an uh, event is happening at the, um, at the rails, I do not want to use the train anymore and I want to use another type of uh, modality. That's why I also want to be able to modify my journey during the trip. And finally, also payment is, uh, is one of the functions of mobility as a service. So um, another way to present this is um, I'd like to use this slide. It is about the mass integration levels. Um, those five integration levels I used from an article uh, of so Sochor and Saracini. It's often used to explain the different integration levels of, uh, of mass. And first of all, uh, you can, of course, have no integration when you only present a single modality um, by a single... Um, uh, seller. Then you have the, the, the first integration level, and I think this is the integration level that we use every day to plan our trip. Um, we are aiming for the fourth level, 
but during the conversations with the, all the market parties, we found out that it is already very hard to uh, reach to level two of the, those mass integration levels because this is the integrated uh, platform or app where you can also book and pay for your trip within one platform. Um, then maybe one thing about the fourth level, this does not have to do with standards that much because this is really how we can, as a government, also be involved in those um, positive societal benefits of mobility as a service. Um, for example, the spreading of traffic to avoid rush hour or to get people more into sustainable modes like bike sharing or public transport. Um, but now why I'm on this, uh, on this stage, with those conversations with the market parties, we ask them, could you set up for us a mobility as a service platform uh, for the Netherlands, but also um, for cross-border transport. We'd like to see those integrated apps for those level uh, for integration. Um, but they told us, yeah, well, we can do it, but standardization is one of the key elements and we need standards to be able to um, create this integral um, integrated platform. So that's why I use this slide. Standardization results in an efficient ecosystem. Um, when, we, when you create an extra uh, layer between the transport operator and the actual user, uh, the mobility as a service platform, um, you can imagine that a lot of data needs to be exchanged. Um, my neighbor just told me about all the developments for the exchange of data with the government, but as you can imagine, you also need exchange of data between the transport operators and the mass providers. So my other neighbors told about this, but this is not for the fully integrated um, system. So that's why we uh, set up an open working group, um, also an international working group. I think a lot of members are from the Netherlands, but also from broader Europe and even international uh, to create such an open ecosystem in which we can develop a standard for those integrated uh, mass apps. So it's a public-private working group. Um, I try to set all people together and they are um, in kite delivery um, delivering the uh, um, expertise to set up such a standard. Um, so it's really important that both the mass providers and the transport operators are involved because they are actually the stakeholders that need this um, um, exchange of data. Uh, we facilitated this because of the slide before that I showed you, we want those integrated services. Um, and yeah, one thing that is important to mention is that we try to use all those existing standards, but that back then we found out that for those fully integrated services, there is no standard yet. So we uh, set up the, the TOMP API. Um, also to create this level playing field when some new uh, party is entering the market, for example, a new bike, sh uh, shared bike operator, we also want to give them the opportunity to sell their assets through those uh, existing platforms. Well, then that's when, when we started the TOMP Working Group, I think about three or four years ago. Um, the TOMP Working Group is creating and maintaining the TOMP API. Um, TOMP is standing for Transport Operator to Mobility Provider, and it is the um, um, API between those two uh, parties. And this is the basis of the, of the API. It is the connection between the mobility or the mass provider and the transport operator. The beauty about it is that the transport operator is very generic in within this API. So it's for bike sharing, but also for, for example, public transport, um, taxis and shared cars. Um, and then it also uh, is interoperable with third party apps such as a clearinghouse or a personal data store or for example the user information that is needed to create a fully integrated mass uh, travel. Then a bit into the functional building blocks, well I'm not a developer but um, overall I do understand a bit about how the, uh, the API works. Um, first of all um, you see that those uh, functional blocks also 
um, are represented in the uh, functions of mass that I presented in the in the first slide. And we start with uh, the operator information where you, for example, know um, this bi shared bike operator, operator is operating here and he has uh, shared bikes for, for example, adults. Um, this module is fully based on the existing standard GBFS. So um, um, that also ensures this interoperability. Then we have a functional block for the, uh, for the planning. So you can exchange information about, uh, about a trip. Um, and I have to mention here that it is a two-way API. So it facilitates the dialogue between the mass operator or the mass provider and the transport operator. Then we created a module for booking, a uh, module for trip execution, which, which is quite difficult because for this uh, generic transport operator, you can imagine uh, you have to do different things when you order a taxi or when you um, open the lock of a shared bike. Uh, then a module for payment and a module, uh, module for support. All this together is the, is the TOMP API which we created in this, uh, this open working group. Um, and uh, this results in the possibility to create such, a, uh, such an open platform in which you can uh, plan, book, and pay your travel, multimodal travel. And this is what we are actually doing in, uh, in the Netherlands, uh, facilitated and subsidized by the, uh, by the national government. Um, eight mass applications were launched last year. Um, all focusing on different target groups. So, for example, we have a mass um, application that is focusing on disabled people or people in a wheelchair, but also um, an application that is focusing on employers or um, at cross-border uh, transport. So, all those applications are now um, can be downloaded in the uh, in the App Store. And we are now really looking into what is the actual impact of those applications on the on the mobility uh, network and on the, for example, the policy goals like sustainability and, uh, and inclusivity. Um, I think those were my slides. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. And um, over to the next speaker. Thank you, Ron. <laughs> And just to say, you're not just a simple policy advisor at uh, the ministry. <laughs> you're also the one behind Tom Working Group. <laughs> so next, I would like to give the floor to Thomas. He will present you the solutions made by Enroute to actually support a lot of conversion between uh, NetEx, uh, Transmodel World, and the GFS World, so GTFS and GBFS. Thomas. Yes, uh, thank you, uh, Tuto. First, uh, thank you for having me as a speaker. Uh, and uh, here uh, for this event, it's my, my first time in uh, Canada, so I certainly enjoy enjoy it a lot. Um, so I'm going to um, first introduce uh, En route because uh, it's not a point where we need no introduction. We're not at that point yet. Um, so uh, and then uh, uh, through our projects, uh, Schwetz, uh, Schwetzas and Arsas. Uh, we'll see how it contributes to uh, interoperability, and uh, then uh, we'll have a, a quick look at uh, some uh, specific tools uh, we are developing for uh, conversion and uh, validation uh, on the on the side. Uh, so first, um, our what well, let's say our main main products. Um, we are we offer uh, access to two uh, data uh, management platforms. Um, one is uh, Schwetzas. Um, it allows to uh, manage uh, schedule uh, and data and equipment, and the other is RSS um, uh, to manage uh, real time uh, data. Um, so these two uh, platform um, are built around. Uh, data standards uh, that they are uh, DNA, uh, so we uh, accept um, uh, to uh, feed uh, both platforms and uh, in diffusion uh, different uh, data standards, uh, of course, uh, GTFS and GTFS RT, uh, and uh, the European standards, um, NetEx and Siri. Uh, we also accept uh, um, Net Neptune, which is specific uh, French uh, French format. Um, so, 
to uh, re um, rebound on what uh, Tutu said. Uh, there's not, not really any war between the data formats. Uh, that's basically what we are for. Uh, because uh, that's basically uh, we will see our customers uh, use the different data standards but it just uh, allows them to uh, respond to different uh, needs and with our platforms uh, it allows to uh, basically do that seamlessly or as sim sim seamlessly as possible anyway so uh, a word on our uh, approach um, our main defining character is that we are SaaS platforms. It's quite uh, quite unique and specific uh, in the transport industry. So, uh, of course, it gives access directly to a platform. Uh, you have specific advantage associated to that, uh, included the mutualized software development. So uh, we, we developed uh, new functionalities. Um, it gives access to all our customers. Um, of course, we have a uh, um, a multi-format and entry and diffusion uh, and also we cover or we work on covering a wide range of transport modes we are working working on it so we we have uh, worked on the extended modes of uh, transport uh, recently and also it uh, allows to uh, empower our customer because they have access to pla to a platform uh, with specific interface so they can actually see the data they are working with, uh, which is a, a big, uh, big feature uh, to work on the data preparation. So a few uh, main use cases for Schwedsas are uh, introduced here. Our main, uh, main feature for Schwed are uh, basically the automatization of the uh, data management chain. Um, it goes from collection uh, to uh, publication. Uh, in between, uh, you can, of course, uh, directly input uh, uh, new data, uh, correct it if it's wrong, uh, control it uh, automatically through control sets, and aggregate uh, different uh, 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 data uh, data sets um, for some of our uh, of our customers. Um, it allows, of course, to prepare uh, data information for different users that are. Uh, one of the main use cases as well and uh, specifically for uh, PTAs it allows to aggregate different uh, data sets for on a given territory to have a clean transport data for any reuse you you you, you, may, you may have. One of the uh, small uh, use cases for Schwedt is also uh, the fact that you have an eye on, on the data you are working with through uh, uh, our GraphQL uh, API uh, to, uh, for data visualization and of course the platform itself uh, to actually see the calendars uh, basically any, any element of the of the scheduled data and uh, and modify it if uh, needed the main use cases for R as basically the same except of course because it's real-time data uh, the the use cases differ a bit uh, we are talking about data streams instead of data data sets and uh, it's uh, about uh, ensuring consistency of uh, of uh, data streams uh, but uh, aggregation uh, functionality are quite the same uh, and in terms of uh, network as well um, an important aspect of ara is uh, uh, historization and monitoring of data streams uh, which is uh, something we work a lot uh, these days to allow um, our customers to have a view on the different data stream to monitor them and see where exactly uh, they fail the, the problem they are automatically notified so it comes with the really the automatization of the of the uh, data management uh, process a few of our customers uh, we are basic we have basically uh, three types of di different types of customers of course the uh, the major transport operators we are working with uh, so, um, of course, RTP Dev, for example, Keolis, uh, Transdev, are uh, networks we are working with uh, to prepare data. Uh, they can use our uh, platforms, um, both uh, Schwedt and R in synergy, uh, sometimes needed when we're working with GTFS and GTFS RT, but also independently Schwedt or R. Um, uh, you, uh, we have also have. Um, uh, 
uh, transport authorities, our main customer, CDFM, of course, uh, Citral uh, for Lyon, uh, different regions uh, which are uh, uh, connected to our main use cases to basically prepare data on a specific territory to aggregate all the data from different transport operators, different network uh, uh, to, to make a clean and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, rich uh, data sets uh, on the way out. Uh, and also a new another type of factors we are uh, considering expanding our net and platforms are uh, data exchange platforms uh, national access points uh, which is why we try to tender to specific needs related to that uh, we'll come to that a bit uh, later so uh, an example of uh, are the um, uh, data standards are used with our customers is of course indicative uh, use of the different data standards but it shows that uh, b um, basically uh, we have uh, uh, the different data standards regardless of uh, of uh, whether it's GTFS uh, uh, on ATX or in uh, uh, scheduled data or uh, Siri or GTFS RT uh, in real-time data it depends really on the needs. Uh, so what what we can see that GTFS uh, are, is a, a data standard that is favored uh, in terms of uh, uh, dissemination of uh, uh, scheduled data sets. Uh, it's a, a broader uh, adoption range, uh, which make it, uh, makes it a big, uh, broadest interest. But we also find uh, for open data, uh, NetX, uh, which is uh, in line with the European regulations. Of course, uh, it takes time for different actors to, to comply to that, but uh, it's uh, coming as well. So it's really a, a mixed use depending on, on, on the needs uh, and uh, on basically what you have to, we need, you need to do with data. Uh, same goes with uh, real-time data. You can, uh, we can see that uh, Siri is uh, uh, the most common. Uh, for for customers, but uh, we also have a GTFS RT. So um, yeah, you use uh, what uh, Tuto uh, Tuto mentioned. The format is only, only a mean, not uh, the end goal. That's very true, and uh, it's coming from the field. So in terms of uh, interoperability, uh, I mentioned Trent Schwetzas and Arasas. Uh, it's a really uh, very specific needs uh, pertaining to uh, data producers and data cons consumers which are really the main part of uh, what we do and the needs that we uh, identify because it all, all comes to really data preparation. That's uh, the bulk of, of the market needs. Uh, it tends to be uh, uh, underestimated to be the, the indon, uh, hidden part of the iceberg, but it's really, from our perspective, is really the, the, the most important needs when it comes to our, to our customers. And uh, that's why uh, Shwetana uh, really respond to that. And because they are able to manage the different data standards, they are really um, able to answer to the, to the different need that way. Now, we also have uh, other actors, of course, which are more of a vertical integration model uh, compared to data producer, data consumer, who have a, a more uh, horizontal integration model. Uh, so there are the data exchange platform, mobility data is one of them, uh, the national access points of, as well, and they need, of course, transverse uh, uh, tools to manage the different uh, data standards seamlessly, uh, which is why we developed specific, uh, specific tools uh, in that regard. Uh, I will mention that a bit uh, later, Schwed Convert, and we have also work uh, dedicated to validation tool uh, regarding NetX and, uh, and, and Siri. Uh, Schwed Convert, what does it do? Uh, so it's simple. Uh, you take a GTFS file in entry and convert it to an ATX uh, file on the way out uh, uh, in line with the different profiles. Uh, it seems a bit simple. So it's basically what, uh, what uh, Schwed is doing on the platform uh, for customers, uh, but is ad hoc tool for uh, people who wouldn't like to, to use the Schwed, Schwed platform. Um, an important uh, aspect of it is uh, really through a two-step API. Um, an important uh, remark uh, about it is that uh, it's not important if it's GTFS on latex. The important fact is that we have quality data <laughs> in the file uh, because the fact if you if you need a latex file, if if you have bad quality data, 
uh, from your GTF uh, GTFS file, you won't you won't you won't do uh, much with it anyway. But it uh, answers that that specific needs um, uh, that that way for any. Uh, question regarding that that tool we have a documentation uh, available now on our postman maybe you you will have the presentation uh, send uh, your way so you uh, you will have a look second uh, uh, thing we are uh, tools we are working on are uh, some specific uh, validation tools it's ad hoc tools that we used uh, internally with Shred and uh, NR, but just on for concobo test it's not uh, industry as yet yet but um, the idea is to have ad hoc tools that would uh, validate uh, NetX and Siri uh, file, um, adding them a set of uh, c control sets that you would permit, you, you, would, you would set up yourself. Uh, it's not a, it's a non-canonical vali validation tool because it's, it's not about uh, if the NetX or Siri file is uh, correct, is not, uh, it doesn't make any sense when it comes to European standards, but m uh, mostly with business needs, you would set uh, uh, different uh, uh, needs that you would have that are not in line with the data standard itself, but with your needs. Uh, I will have uh, I will have an example. There is nothing typically wrong with uh, having a different transportation mode in a, in a uh, NetX file, for example. But for your uh, your needs, it may be uh, uh, wrong and messy to have one of your operators uh, having another uh, transportation mode uh, than a bus, for example. So uh, in that in mind, you would be able to set a control uh, rule. Uh, that would flag the use of another transportation mode uh, other than that bus. Uh, is not is not really related to uh, respecting the data standard itself, but it's very important for for, for the customer needs. Uh, so that the idea would be to develop that the specific tools that they would be um, uh, we would be able to use uh, without uh, having access to Shred, Shred or uh, our platforms. So different, uh, like the organization is displayed there. Uh, so uh, an authority would define uh, the different control sets in line with different profile, and you would have uh, uh, control uh, sets that you, you that would indicate where your uh, file is wrong regarding the, the set uh, control rules. Uh, of course, for uh, theory, it's a bit different because it's data streams. Uh, it all uh, uh, has to do with uh, monitoring the data streams and uh, and obtaining uh, statistic in return to uh, to uh, see where the uh, uh, different data stream are not in line with the different uh, rule, uh, control rule sets uh, that, uh, control rules that we would have set up previously. Uh, these two um, validation tools are. Uh, uh, at the early stage with us, so we are using regularly uh, use them regularly internally, but we are still working on just raising the, the the different uh, aspects of it, and especially having a user interface to to set the uh, uh, control rules for 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 users. Uh, but that will be ad hoc tools that would uh, uh, contribute to 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 validation uh, uh, into uh, ultimately uh, interoperability. So that. Me uh, down being gone. So, thank, thank you, you thank you very much. Thank you. So, we'll move to Gislain, who represents Fabrique des Mobilités today, and they have made a very interesting recent report on all the different standards that exist out there for mass, and also they have very interesting new project that he will present to you. Thank you, Toto. Uh, thank you, everybody. Um, I'm very pleased to be with you today. Um, I will have the opportunity this afternoon to comment on bold on the experience that has been shared uh, by all of you guys on uh, uh, different kind of standards, different governance. Uh, so I, I won't comment now because different time slots and uh, different opportunities to do it. But I just wanted to introduce something related, uh, a current project we have related to interoperability. Uh, when I when I expect uh, it has been. Uh, uh, that word uh, you just uh, m mentioned before is that uh, when you build um, mass, especially more specifically at level two or three of integration, you will need 
user preferences and user management of in uh, in a way of another. Oops. Uh, so I will give you a brief overview of what could happen if you, what will happen if you don't have standardization in that field, user management and uh, single sign-on, these kind of questions, and also what could happen if we agree on standards, uh, more specifically in mobility industry. Uh, and also I'll give you a few words on the specification we're working on uh, due this year, and that we try to implement and test uh, in the next few months. And I would be most interested if you could, if we could debate off a few questions because I've got only two slides, which means that hopefully we have a few minutes to talk about them. But do not overestimate the fact that, that one slide could be like five or 10 minutes with me, but we'll see. Uh, what happens uh, today in many uh, mass projects in Europe, in France, and probably in different countries? is that, uh, well, you, you need to manage your users. You, need, you have user accounts in a mass product, in a mass service, in a mobility service providers. Uh, so you might have five or 10 mobility service providers. And maybe you don't know it in North America, but in, in Europe at least, you could have like 20 or 30 or 40 mobility providers. Uh, that's a different landscape, which means that you have as many uh, user accounts as you have uh, services, obviously. And what happens in, in most projects is that everybody is doing it in its own way. And usually, especially in France, I would say we like resets, you know, we like uh, having our, our own receipt to manage users, authorizations, federations, privacy policies. And, and we have also, as you know, privacy po policies are important in, in Europe, which means that people for the last few years, um, cities more specifically, uh, it has been a very important aspect of what they do, privacy policies, uh, GDPR, these kind of things. And in each project, you have very different technical components and solutions that are adopted. And as usual, you have costs. Uh, not only cost of integrations, obviously, uh, but loss of opportunity and no interoperability. Uh, I don't live in Paris, and uh, I might have an account in my, c in my home city, if I go to Paris or another French city, so it, there will be no link between my user account and what I could do, what, I, what services I could purchase and access in another city. So no interoperability, a lot of lost opportunities, uh, for instance, as a mobility service provider, uh, while well a transport operator, it means that your clients might be cities, your clients might be like mass operators, public or private, uh, like Uber, like Google Maps, like tra Transit or whatever. It means for each client or partner, you will have to comply to their own receipt from linking to user accounts, managing authentication, uh, managing uh, different APIs that want to access data or make use of some personal data and managing these privacy policies. Obviously, it won't make it. Well, actually, in the digital world, that's not a new issue. And there are some standards to manage most of these issues. Uh, you probably know, know them. It's Open Authentication 2.0 and Open ID Connect. Well, these are used in many services we all use every day, uh, mainly uh, service for the general public, uh, like uh, Google, Apple, Facebook, Facebook Connect. Uh, these kind of services, they all use OpenID Connect usually. Uh, there are other standards uh, in your company to access different services, web services, uh, with, with only one user account. So it's pretty efficient. And OpenID Connect uh, combined with Open Authentication too. Uh, it's a pretty efficient standard. You can handle authentication, SSO, and you can do it in a clean and secure way. That's, that's cool. On the other hand, if you have different projects, different contexts, uh, different mobility projects, or combined mobility or mass projects, you will have different technical choices for what we call scopes, which means uh, scopes It's what kind of authorization you give to an API uh, to access data or perform whatever actions they would possibly want to do. 
And in different projects, uh, while you, you might have different uh, transport mode requirements, for instance, uh, car sharing operators usually would be quite fond of accessing data about your driving license. Obviously, a bike sharing operator is not supposed to require such an access. At least from a GDPR point of view in Europe, it's quite important because a bike sharing operator is not supposed to require access to this information uh, if it doesn't need it. So at some point, it should translate in your technical solution. Obviously, it's not difficult to do, especially with OpenID Connect. It's just that everybody will do it its own way uh, based on the same standard. So you will get some interoperability, but with a cost because different projects, even based on OpenID Connect, would still have a different set of options, of adaptations uh, that are more related to your business needs and to your use cases. Also, what happens is that in the mobility industry, and more specifically in France, once again, what happens is that every city, every project is meant to be different. Like, you know, car sharing in France must be very different from car sharing in Montreal, even if it's the same company, Cominuto, uh, is based both in Montreal and in France, but you know, in every city, it's always very different. It can't be the same as at the next city, you know. Uh, it can't work the same way, which means that different projects will, will need to have different options. But at the end of the day, that's not really true, you know. And if you want interoperability, that's a common good, and we all strive for interoperability because it's business opportunities, but, but it's also a better uh, user experience. And from a public perspective, uh, it makes sense to make sure that you use public money, like rationally, and uh, also that you can do it faster. So what do you need for interoperability when, when it comes to users? Uh, you need this popular standard like OpenID Connect. And that would be good is if every project is based on it. But also, you need to describe how your data, the data you usually share in your industry, like mobility, uh, what kind of data do you need? What kind of information on a passenger? Uh, passenger requirements, uh, passenger specific needs. Um, that's always the same thing, but in different projects, you could describe it in different ways, which means that when you want to link two accounts that describe the same information with different data, once again, that's an issue. But it, that's fairly easy to have a common way to describe the same information. That's what we would try to do. Uh, also, we, we, we could agree on a standardized way to use the standard, which means uh, privacy requirement, GDPR, uh, technical scopes to build APIs. We could define a set of scopes uh, that are well suited to car sharing operators, another one for bike sharing, another one for two mass apps that would like to talk together, this kind of thing. Um, and also if we could automate the fact that you have in France, you have only 300 PTAs. Well, that's France, so it, we have a lot of them. Uh, but we also have dozens, dozens and dozens of uh, transport operators and mobility operators in many different uh, fields and with different services, uh, car sharing, bike sharing, moped sharing, and so on. So it, and some of them, uh, there are you, are, you have new one every year, which means that probably you, you, you would have to enroll to enroll new in, uh, operators and new services every year uh, for all uh, for all the apps, which which means that if we can automate how different uh, user accounts in different operators uh, can be linked together, it could also uh, be useful. So what we do is that we write a, a specification uh, that will offer all of this, uh, the right on column. Uh, we'll standardize how we def define data, how we access this data, what we can do with this data. We will um, embed uh, best practices um, and we'll do this by this year and uh, we will test it uh, the second part of this year. Uh, I will go very quickly. Uh, so we define what user data we want to share. Then we define how to use OpenID Connect as a standard and we tell people on cities and operators, you should use OpenID Connect. We tell them how they should use OpenID Connect with the scopes and authorization, what kind of authorizations and how to embed uh, 
ecosystem best practices, not only GDPR, but it's also it could be related uh, depending on the country, uh, how car sharing operators want to manage uh, user data and what are their specific requirements. And then we try to automate all of this, uh, building on actually a draft specification uh, because OpenID Connect Federation is still draft, but we build a draft on a draft way because we like to test things and we'll see what happens. But we feel like even if federation could be a long-term concept, uh, if you want to build uh, authentication federations, we need to, right from the beginning, to ask people to just provision the fact that someday we will have federations of transport authorities, federations of operators. And a few ques questions, but could be for discussion after this panel. Uh, well, actually, uh, do you use uh, how how is uh, SSO so single site and authentication achieved in mass projects today? And I'm sure you have some experience around this. Uh, do you use third-party ID providers uh, like some service providers that provide this identification, like Facebook Connect? Uh, do you do you use some of them, or do you use local or national equivalent? Uh, ID providers and uh, how such a standard on an approach specification uh, could be useful in your own projects uh, on more specifically mass projects. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Gislain. So this was a very dense first session, but we still have, I believe, that's why we started early, 14 minutes for questions. So what we wanted to give you is an overview of all the standards that exist out there. And as Christophe said, as Andrew and everyone else on the panel said, we are all working on solving some problems. And we are lucky to all be working together for that. So please come to us if you have any questions starting from now. If you want to learn more about account mobility, if you want to learn more about how you can describe your cities, the parking, and so on. Tell us, tell us your need, and we will tell you if it has been done, if it hasn't been done, to which colleague, to which entity you should actually talk to. But globally, on a scale, let's say, raise your hand, if we manage to give you at least the name, the project, an initiative of a specification you didn't know before you entered this room. Yay! I think <laughs> I think we we, we, we we can have managed here to make sure that we give you an insight of a st specification or a standard you didn't know about uh, about before entering the room. So, do we have any questions from the room? Hello, good day. Uh, I was very interested about the new standard you were talking uh, previously called the OPRA. 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 Could you tell us more about it, and could it could it integrate as well some uh, partic uh, remontée participative as well? Yes. So, so Opera is really a complement. So you, you you see, and we 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 have NetX for the scheduled information, Siri for the real time. So no Opera is really covering everything to describe what happened on the on the on, on the network. Uh, there are multiple use uses plan for it. So uh, the work has been started for with uh, a, what we call a technical report at, at, at CN and the standards for exchange of information is going to start being defined uh, at the end of, from the end of this year, so probably will be re ready uh, next year. Um, the idea is, it's a opera is operational raw data, so the idea is really to provide everything describing what happened on the network, but not providing the indicators themselves, providing the raw data so people can build indicator about them. Uh, but, but so, so because indicator may be different from one 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 place to 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 to, to the other, and and the scope of the data is quite wide. It co it could be just having the real passing time that occurs on the network, uh, the, the, the delays and so on, so re knowing how, how did the, the service perform, but also having the information about how the network was used, but so meaning where did the people start that mainly that journey from and where did they go, uh, uh, how many people were in the, this kind, this, this 
vehicle or, or, or this this other one. So pro most probably there will be some 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 connection with some uh, on, 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 on this. Uh, so the idea is really to provide all the information, also how, how many t tickets were were bought uh, and or, or or sold and and, and so on. So that, that's really the usage of the network, but never giving indicators, only giving the raw data and then. People receiving this information will be their their indicators uh, from it. There was multiple uh, reason to go in that direction. Some are j just from the European regulation. The ITI directive clearly asked for, for for this, so that that's a re requirement in, in 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 Europe. But also because there are a lot of needs, typically between uh, operators and authority. Uh, the authority often have to pay the operator for the service, but then they, to, to pay them, they need a lot of information on uh, knowing how many kilometers were, were run and uh, how, how many passengers were carried and, and so on. So they need this raw data to have the information and they, they need to have it in a consistent and systematic way. What's hap happening these days, it's very often from w one delivery to another one, the, 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 the data is different, the meaning is different, and so they don't know how to, how to manage and how to, what to do. So interpretability here is really key and is really highly expected from, from authority. I've got a question on Opwa on MDS. Do you see links of bridges to build between the two? Because at least at some level, uh, MDS is also about what happened at uh, on the transport operator operations side. Uh, so do you think there are some bridges uh, to build at some point, or is it uh, two different aspects of uh, the question? Th there has to be some, some, some bridges, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure. Uh, also, Opera, is, is it, it started, uh, the, the, the TR was done uh, at the time where, uh, personally, I was not aware of MDS, now I am. <laughs> so that, that will obviously make uh, li life easier. And we we are really trying uh, at, at CN level to to I mean the, the, to, to to embed the, the, the uh, all, all the organization even not coming from 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 Europe to to to, to, to get having what we call liaison uh, to 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 collect the the, the the needs and try to include them in what we're doing. So yeah, obviously I will be very happy if we can work together on on, on this. Yeah, similarly, just you want to know more about uh, Oprah and, fi and find out because I, I believe there needs to be. And that, that whole concept of interoperability, I mean, there's the distinctions can be clearer sometimes than where there is opportunity to have beneficial overlap. And so I think exploring that more is partly what this is all about. So it's exciting. Hi, uh, my name is Jennifer. Um, I'm a certified planner here in the US. And I think my question is for Andrew. Um, I'm curious to know if. Uh, the Open Mobility Foundation is involved in any efforts to um, support data standardization in the planning practice around zoning, uh, planning, inventory of infrastructure, because it's something that um, myself and the APA Technology Division are interested in leading the charge on. So my sh short answer will be yes. Uh, Great. <laughs> you know, and then, and so then, how? What exactly that looks like? I mean, let's let's find out how we we can talk because partly, the the mobility data specification. It's it's so you heard the GXFS. I mean, so we're now in the process of kind of defining the MXS. And so, where does mobility standards, or I shouldn't say, um, you know, I guess not necessarily mobility, but just overall the the standards can apply to other types of, I mean, whether it's you know, planning practices or actually infrastructure. Um, I'd say the curb data specification is kind of the, the first uh, reach into, uh, not necessarily the first, but kind of the next reach into digitizing infrastructure and trying to define the standards around that, that digital interface. So, I mean, it's how do cities in all of the infrastructure policies that they have to manage begin to interact with any number of different users and operators that aren't just, you know, like physically walking or rolling, but are actually um, integrating or um, interfacing on a, on a digital realm. And if I can add, Jennifer, try and find in the room Antoine from the French National Access Point. Uh, 
if you can't find him, I will probably be able to point it to you. Uh, the, the French National Access Point have developed the first ever specification to actually describe the cycling infrastructure. It's not perfect, but at least we have all the bike ways, the bike lane, if they cross uh, a lane that is dedicated to vehicles and so on. Uh, with the support of the entire cycling industry and mobility data, it has been translated into English and it's only waiting to find a new home, I guess. So maybe OMF might be the new home for that one because it's going to bridge the curb. That's perfect. That's a great example. Thanks. Hi, uh, Ritesh from IBI. Um, question for Andrew in this case. Um, CDS and MDS, just trying to almost contrast with GTFS. Um, in GTFS world, the mobility provider happens to be government, providing data to the private sector most of the time. MDS, CDS are almost the flip of it, which is it is private operators, aggregate data aggregated by government, by municipalities, providing them to other entities. How do you see an organization like OMF balancing the needs of the public and the private spheres in something like this, where the dynamics are very different than the GTFS world? Yeah, and you, you articulated that distinction um, well. And I, and I think the, that balance is, I mean, it, it's critical, and that's what we're kind of sort of constantly striving to do. And where, you know, you'll all just say, you know, the opportunity to bring the public and private entities that are involved in the space. So in this case, in MDS and CDS, it's oftentimes the private companies that are that are generating the data and then that is being required to share with you know, the city, for example. And so um, wanting to actually have those standards co-created, you know, at a table that involves both those parties instead of you know just one or the other. I think mean, that is what we're trying to achieve through the you know open um, uh, mobility foundation as, as well as in you know partnering with mobility data and other entities uh, it's, it's not exactly a, a perfect answer to your question but I think the that's where we need to dig in more because a lot of striking that balance a lot of it is in you know, what the in this case city does with the data and, and I'm, a, I'm a firm believer that the you know in order to really be able to, to manage uh, regulate the public right of way, which is one of the key functions of, of sort of a city department of transport um, in this case, that they need the information, but they don't need everything. And they need to know also sort of define what they intend to do with it and how it is be able to articulate to the, to the companies who are, who are having to share the data as well as the public, how it's beneficial. So I mean, that's, that's what we're constantly working with our members and other users of, of, um, of the standards to be able to help them kind of make that case, strengthen the argument why this, this data sharing is important. That's a follow up. But the other contrast I see is, and this is more maybe a North American context, which is in North America, uh, provision of data in GTFS is voluntary. Europe, it's regulatory. MDS and CDS is a different mm -hmm. sort where it is provi data provision by regulation. Mm -hmm. How do you see that kind of playing a role in the evolution of the spec? Yeah, and, it, and it's not, uh, I mean, oftentimes the, the origins of MDS came through cities for writing it into their, their ordinances or writing it into their regulations. But you know, one of the things that we want to try to emphasize is there is a uh, significant value to the companies in having uh, standards, it's just the benefit of standardization, across the markets that they work in. So they're not having to recreate the wheel in each city that they operate in. So although MDS kind of got, got, uh, got started through by, by pretty much being a, a requirement, um, I think now more and more the operators are seeing the benefit of, of that standardization and are, I don't want to say they're, they're not altruistic in the sense of giving you know data freely but at the same time they're more willing to because they see the benefit in doing that now CDS is a little bit different because there is a uh, there if, if we do this right there is a commercial benefit to companies sharing that data it you know in the of course kind of the handshake there is that cities then make it easier more reliable and more efficient to use the curb 
I mean, right now, I mean, it's talk about the valuable real estate that, that curb space sort of occupies. Cities don't manage it kind of worth a damn right now I mean, in most cases. And so, you know, it's it's on you know us as kind of the intermediary or that convener of, of the public and private spaces, but then ultimately on cities to demonstrate that by participating in this um, in this uh, sort of partnership and by providing data, cities are going to actually create a, a system that truly does benefit, you know, whether it's an AP, uh, AV operator like uh, Waymo, um, that they have really you know, predictable and safe pickup and drop off zones or uh, commercial delivery. You know, their cities right now don't necessarily know where all their, their commercial delivery zones are or how they're being used. So that data needs to, that use case there is that through the data sharing uh, and through the curb data specification, cities should be able to very clearly communicate back this is you know how the space is being used and make the case for either adding more et cetera et cetera so there becomes more of a of a commercial benefit there for the companies we have time for one last question uh this might be in the weeds but what is the relationship between um the cds and curb lr and shared streets i'm not familiar with the technic technical parts of the cds you're right, it's in the weeds. <laughs> <laughs> too, too much? Should we do a bigger overview question for the last? Yeah, certainly. Well, and, and part of it, part of it just gets to the fact that I'm, uh, I'm not in the position to give you the best answer as I could. So, but I can certainly uh, get you the answer. So, all in all, I'm very thankful for all our experts on the stage here to have come and join us to present their standards, their initiatives. I'm also very happy that we were able to share with you some of the insights of standardization happening behind the scenes and initiatives that maybe you were not aware of. And if anything, I think lunch is open in the CAFCONS and I would invite you to reach out to our experts for all the questions you still have and answered and i know that throughout the two days they will be able to provide you answers thank you again for joining us for this um, wonderful first panel and thank you to all of you for listening in <laughs>